you're starting now? Yep. Okay. Let me close your camera. Whoa. Okay, so um, the basic idea of quantum field theory on a lattice um, is to be able to approximate uh, path integrals numerically or even analytically, but certainly numerically. And the idea is that instead of defining a field at every point in space time, um, we define them for every time, we define them um, at different lattice points. And the lattice points I'm writing as V for vertex is a lattice spacing times the triplet of integers i, j, k. And if you're actually doing these integrals numerically, then you have i, j, k running from uh, 1 to 10, 1 to 20, 1 to 100, depending on what your computer resources are and what the dimension of space is. Um, the, uh, if you're in one dimension, you can easily use uh, uh, 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 lattice uh, points. But in uh, two dimensions, every time you double the lattice uh, dimensions, the number of points goes up by four. And if you um, instead have a three-dimensional space of the lattice or a four-dimensional space-time lattice, um, then uh, it goes up by uh, eight or 16. Um, and of course, one discretizes time as well. Um, but uh, I've made explicit the uh, discretization of space here. <clears throat> but one does a, same, a, a similar lattice in time. And the key thing is that one imitates the commutation relations of the field in um, the continuum, namely that the field commutes with itself at equal times, the momentum, comm momentum commutes with itself at equal times. And for that reason, you can have states that are simultaneous eigenstates of the field at all points in space, or it's simultaneous or you can have, and you can have states, the simultaneous eigenstates of the momentum at all points in space. And so these are indicated here, where this is the field operator at a particular vertex. Here's an eigenvector, and it's an eigenvector of this field operator, of this field operator at this vertex with eigenvalue phi prime sub v. But if you change v to v prime, it's an eigenvalue with, uh, it's an eigenvector with eigenvalue phi prime sub v prime. And uh, this one eigenvector is a simultaneous eigenvector of all the fields um, at all the vertices of your spatial lattice. And the same thing for pi, which is an eigenvector of uh, all the momentum operators on all the lattice vertices. And of course, they have commutation relations that imitate those of the continuum, instead of IH bar delta function, we have a chronic or delta, and then we divide by the cube of the lattice spacing. I'm thinking in terms of three dimensions. And of course, the vertex is the lattice spacing times a triplet of integers. The inner product of two of these eigenvectors is a product over all the spatial vertices of phase factors that just imitate what's this. This all imitates slavishly the uh, the continuum theory um, as closely as it can be imitated on a lattice. The identity operators are integrals over all values of the field, over all field eigenvalues, and a direct product over all the lattice uh, vertices. And the same thing for momentum. The uh, gradient squared is um, the difference of the field at neighboring lattice place, uh, spacings, neighboring vertices that differ in the x direction, the y direction, or the z direction, those things squared and then divide by a squared. So that's basically how one sets up the uh, theory on a lattice. And 
um, the nice thing about this is that all of a sudden everything is finite, um, but of course as you take the limit of A going to zero, um, all the old infinities start to reappear again. Um, okay, so a, a Hamiltonian, a simple Hamiltonian for a scalar field is, would be one half an integral of pi squared plus if I actually use the, if I use universal units, it's c squared times gradient of pi squared plus m squared c to the fourth over h bar squared pi squared p cubed x. So that's the um, field operator in the continuum. You, normally I use natural units and in fact it took me some time to um, to derive what the universal units are, um, but uh, that's what uh, they actually are. Um, but for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to go back to, or almost all of the lecture, I'm going to go back to natural units, although I may have h bars floating around because um, it, it plays a more important role than c. It's, I mean, it's really natural to set C equal to 1. It's less, it's, well, it's, it's, it's less simple, let us say, less intuitive to set H bar equal to 1. So what we, I, I, I want to get through a lot of material here. If we had infinitely many uh, classes left, um, I could go through this in, in real detail, but I think I'm going to need to skip something, which is why I wrote these down before um, class started. So this is minus i, let's consider a, a time evolution operator, Tb minus Ta k plus b, where, as usual, k is a, and b are the lattice and versions of the kinetic and potential energy. With the uh, Trotter product formula, this is e to the minus i epsilon k to the minus i epsilon b raised to the um, nth power, um, where epsilon is Tb minus Ta over um, n. And um, this basically imitates um, what we did uh, in quantum mechanics of a single variable in a single dim dimension, minus i epsilon k minus i epsilon v um, phi sub a, this turns out to be um, phi 1 e to the minus i epsilon k uh, we put in a complete set of momentum eigenstates um, uh, and uh, we have e to minus i epsilon v on phi sub a. Well, this is an eigenvector of this operator, so this just becomes phi a. This is an eigenvector of this operator, which is just um, k, uh, which is the momentum squared, basically summed over all the lattice points. And um, so what we're left with is just a uh, two factors of this in a product here. And um, I think I'll just say that if we continue in this way, what happens is that putting in n, uh, uh, all n of these Trotter factors, we have here phi b, e to the minus i t, b minus t a, h, I guess I've dropped h bar, which is just as well. This is then a product over vertices and um, the factor here is a cubed n 
over 2 pi i Tb minus Ta um, to the n over 2, and then an integral e to the i, the uh, action on that vertex basically, uh, d phi v, and um, S sub v is uh, Tb minus Ta over n, a cubed over 2, and then a sum. So this is, a, this is what played the role of epsilon before. And it's sum j equals 0 to n minus 1. The notes are on the line, so you, you don't have to go nuts copying this stuff. Phi j v dot minus uh, grad phi j v squared minus m squared uh, phi squared j v minus p of phi v. And um, so this is, this is the action at a single vertex, um, and by summing it, this j refers to a given time slice. Um, and uh, what we have here are uh, um, we're thinking of, I guess, in the we're, we're thinking in the Schrodinger picture, where at every um, let's see, or am I in the Heisenberg picture? <laughs> anyway. Um, anyway, this is a sum over the uh, these are the eigen, these are the eigenvalues of the field operators. This is a time step j vertex v summed over all the time steps, and um, so this is just a generalization of what we had for quantum mechanics. And then we have phi dot j v is n phi j plus 1 at that vertex minus phi j at that vertex divided by Tb minus Ta. And so this n just is reducing this to a tiny time step. And d phi v is um, d phi n minus 1 v dot 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 down to d phi uh, 1 v. So um, that's uh, basically what we what we have. Um, I, I I I guess I'm I'm in a sort of um, I'm not in either picture. What I what I got is I've got time zero eigenstates and operators at every time slice of the spatial lattice, but between the time slices we uh, evolve time forward with this uh, operator one step of time, one step epsilon of time. Um, and so if as we uh, go to the, the something closer to the continuum limit, what we have is phi v uh, e to the minus i tb minus ta h phi a is a, a path integral e to the i s of v d v and the action here, S of phi, is um, dt, d cubed x, at least in the limit of a going to 0, infinitely many points. This is then a half phi dot squared minus grad phi squared minus m squared phi squared, and then minus p 
computer pi. This is for a scalar field. Um, so what, we, what I'm actually what I was doing here was sort of two things at the same time. I was deriving this path integral, this continuum path integral, by um, using the lattice to do the derivation, but by using the lattice to do the derivation, I've also set up lattice quantum field theory, which is a whole field in its own right. Um, so this is, this is basically Feynman's famous formula, or set of formulas, that the top matrix elements of the time evolution operator are path integrals of the action uh, with um, this uh, uh, these formulas, and I guess what I should say is d phi. Um, well, with, let's see. Did I say what d phi? Yeah, here I, I. That's the next equation. D phi that appears here is a product over all vertices of uh, a cubed n over 2 pi i t b minus t a to the n over 2, and then uh, d phi n minus 1, d phi 1. Uh, and then this is all at the particular vertex, and uh, so that's this vertex, that vertex, and uh, I guess I have a right bracket there. Okay, so that's um, that's basically a derivation of the continuum on the path integral with um, a uh, also a, a formulation of lattice quantum field theory. Um, if the action if the action happens to be quadratic in the fields, and that would be the case where this p term is typically zero. If the p term is zero, this thing is quadratic, but more generally, if the action is quadratic, then this path integral here, uh, in fact, let me just say it as e the i s d phi, is then a, turns into a function f of uh, t b, T A and M and so forth, the various parameters of the theory times um, the times the phase factor. And the phase factor is the classical action of a process uh, of the classical process that takes you from the initial configuration phi A to the final configuration phi B in this time interval. And um, in general, such a, a classical process does exist um, because uh, we're dealing with a second order differential equation and two boundary conditions give you a unique answer. In cases where um, such a classical solution did not exist, um, then uh, this integral would be vastly smaller. Yes? When A and B the same, the left part, the left, left hand side should be one. Uh, well, let's see. You're saying, what if we take the eigenstate phi B to be the same as the eigenstate phi A? That's what you yes. want to do. Um, well, no, it's not. It's not unity because um, because. Uh, if the, the state phi a over this time interval can e will evolve typically to a gazillion different possible states, and its inner product with itself would be small typically, but uh, but but there would be a classical solution that would get you there, namely one that um, uh, in which phi dot was zero, grad phi is zero, and uh, I guess that would be a solution that would. So there would be a classical solution, and uh, the answer would be something like that, and this would be just some phase. I was thinking if TA equals to TB, like the, is the other consistent? 
is zero be a, is there a zero in the denominator? When TA oh, you were saying TA equal to TB. I was saying A equal to B, but yeah, it's the same. Okay, well those are those are two different things because the phi A and phi B, these are the eigenvalues of the uh, eigenvalues of various uh, of the operators the field operators at the various vertices um, and uh, whereas with TB and TA as uh, TB go, approaches TA then this does uh, become singular and in fact what maybe what you were getting at is that this as you send TB to TA this thing should be a functional delta function so maybe that's that's what you meant. And yes, you're right. It would be a functional delta function. And in fact, that's a boundary condition that you can use to check uh, check some calculation that as you let TB go to TA, you better get a functional delta function. And that functional delta function is then a product of delta functions at one at every point in the spatial lattice. I'm going to skip the next example. You can read about it. Um, and what about time ordered products? Well, time ordered products are defined, as you know, in the, in the continuum field theory, just as they were in quantum mechanics, and in fact, just as we defined them when we were talking about ordinary quantum field theory. And um, in particular, what happens, just as in ca the case of quantum mechanics, is that we get the following formula, the time ordered product of phi of x1, phi of xn. This is n is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. It is then a ratio of path integrals, n phi b. This is a matrix element of the final field configuration with the eigenstate, the nth eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, product of the fields, a classic, uh, these are just C number fields, these are just things we integrate over, phi of xn, EVI S of phi, times phi A n, d phi, and then this is divided by the same thing, but um, without the fields. So this is divided by another path integral, which is just n phi b, e to the i s of phi, phi a n d phi. So it's a ratio of um, path integrals. And now I think again so as to uh, get through as much material today as possible in order to do other things on Thursday, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to tell you what happens if you go, if you make the transition to finite temperature. Um, in other words, if you use the Boltzmann Uh, operator e to the minus beta h, which is e to the minus h over kt. Um, you do that by set by replacing the time or setting the time equal to minus i h bar beta. Every time I hear h bar beta, I think of Barbados. Uh, I've never been there, but uh, it just pops into my head. Um, which is uh, minus i h bar over kt. So the analog of time here is minus i times h bar over kt. And um, if you now go through the same procedure that I just went through uh, for uh, ordinary time and um, for, for transition amplitudes, in other words, in order to uh, 
develop a path integral for the Boltzmann operator or the partition function, um, what you find is the following. Uh, phi b, phi b, e to the minus beta b minus beta a times h phi a is then an integral e to the minus Euclidean action of phi d phi. The Euclidean action here is an integral du. So I'm doing this in the. I'm doing this. If, if, if I had gone through all the steps, we would have uh, put the theory on the same lattice. But instead of doing uh, e to the minus i t h, we would do e to the minus beta h, where beta is the difference of those two betas. And then um, we would, uh, and then taking the limit a going to zero, we recover these continuum formulas, which are um, one half phi dot squared plus rad phi squared plus m squared phi squared plus p of phi. And, um, here, d of phi is the product over all vertices of a cubed n over 2 pi as beta b minus beta a to the n over 2, and then d phi n minus 1 v dot 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 d phi 1 v. So that's, uh, that's, that's basically the formula. The, the partition function z of beta is then the trace of e to the minus beta h. And trace means that you set phi b equal to phi a. So you set phi b equal to phi a, and then you integrate not only over the, in, over the fields at the intermediate uh, time slices, but also over the initial field and the final field, and you set the final field equal to the initial field. And so this is then uh, an integral e to the minus Euclidean action of phi, uh, phi, Uh, well, let me just uh, shorten this a little bit. D phi, D phi A. So um, it's basically this integral um, integrated over phi A with phi B equal to phi A. And um, so let me just Okay, any questions? All right, now, um, we talk about the field, Euclidean field at x and u, where u is equal to h bar beta, or you can just think of it as beta if you want. Um, and this is uh, e to the u h over beta by at x, this is spatial x, e to the minus u h over beta. And, um, no, h over h bar, what am I saying? So in other words, if you set h bar equal to zero, this is e to the beta h, e to the minus beta h. Um, it, if I ever do a third edition of this book, um, 
which case I'll be certifiably mad. Um, uh, I'm going to set H bar and C one on page one and keep you there, and never screw around with anything else. Um, trying to chase down all these factors is a nightmare. In any event, let me give you the, the analog of this expression, which is really important. The analog is the following. Eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, time-ordered product, phi Euclidean at x1 dot dot dot, phi Euclidean at xn, n is equal to and remember, what is phi Euclidean? It's the ordinary field at time zero with e to the beta h and e to the minus beta h on both sides, on either side. That's what phi Euclidean is. So it's, it's, it's the field as it evolves in imaginary time, if you want, but um, actually it's not time at all. It's e to the beta h and e to the minus beta h. And what this is actually equal to is a ratio n phi b phi of x1 dot 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 phi of xn phi a n e to the minus Euclidean action of the field over h bar and then d phi, and then it's divided by the same thing just without the fields. So it's divided by n phi b phi a n e to the minus you put the n actually with the field d phi. And in the low temperature limit, so this is the, this. In the low temperature limit, the uh, e to the minus beta h goes to the ground state, or something proportional to the ground state. In fact, what it actually goes to is e to the minus beta energy of ground state times the dyadic of the ground states, or the uh, outer product of the ground states. And um, So in particular, if, as you go to the low temperature limit, which is beta going to infinity, this is the beta to infinity limit, or, K, or kt going to zero, um, this uh, goes to zero, zero here, zero, vac vacuum here, vacuum there, vacuum there. And um, in uh, lattice QCD, that's basic, or lattice quantum field theory, that's basically the limit you would take because you're most often interested in um, the ground state theory. Well, I've been moving fast enough so that we can now do perturbation theory. Um, so let's flip back to um, real time as opposed to Euclidean time. And um, so now I'm going to use the same, I'm going to use H0. And so H0 is just the quadratic Hamiltonian for a scalar field with P equal to 0. So it's, it's, it's in fact, um, the thing I wrote down there in universal units, um, I don't know if you want to show it, but it's the H that's in the lower right-hand corner of the left-hand board. And um, I guess I could have written it down more quickly than that. Um, the fields now are evolving with the normal time uh, EVI T H0 phi of X in 0 e to the minus I T H0. So this is how the fields evolve in time. And now I'm going to use um, the uh, 
formula that's at the bottom under the clock um, and uh, choose as the eigenstate n the, 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 uh, instead of it. I'm going to set n equal to the, the vacuum, the ground state of the Hamiltonian H0. So H0, 0, I'm going to set this, I'm going to say that that's uh, equal to 0. Um, this means, I guess, that I've normally ordered the operators in H0 to drop a certain in, in infinite term. But anyway, um, what we have here is time-ordered product fields x1 dot 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 xn is then an integral 0 phi b phi of x1 phi of xn phi a 0 e to the i s 0 of phi d phi and it's this thing divided by the same thing without the fields so that's phi b phi a e to the i s 0 of d phi and s 0 just means the action associated with h 0 and in particular, S0 of P is then uh, one half an integral of minus DA phi, DA phi minus N squared phi squared D fourth X. Um, where, of course, minus dA phi, dA phi is equal to phi dot squared minus grad phi squared. Now we can define four-dimensional Fourier transforms by tilde of P as this integral e to the minus i Px phi of x d fourth x, and uh, consequently the inverse Fourier transform is phi of x equal to e to the i p x by tilde of p d fourth p over two pi to the fourth. You have to put the two pi somewhere. It doesn't matter where, but you can't forget them. Um, and if we do that, if we uh, replace phi of x by its uh, four-dimensional Fourier transform, this uh, action S0 becomes simpler. And um, in fact, it's just S0 of phi is then minus one-half an integral phi tilde of p absolute value squared times p squared plus m squared uh, d fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth. And um, here p squared, of course, is p vector squared minus p zero squared. And for those of you who, let's just remember that phi is a real field and consequently, its Fourier transform satisfies the rule um, phi tilde star of p. And um, okay, so I've pretty much used that much of the board. Now, um, there's a point that. Um, when I was a graduate student, I was always bothered by this. Namely, where did these I epsilons come from? And um, it was um, only later listening to a, a sitting in on Weinberg's quantum field theory when he was lecturing at Harvard a long time ago. Um, 
he explained where the I epsilons came from. And uh, so I'm going to show you, but I don't think I'll, because we want to get through as much material as possible. I'm going to just um, tell you how they come about without um, actually uh, going through the details of the derivation, but it's all in the class notes which are online in LaTeX form and so on. trying to get through a lot of material because it's we're at near the end of the semester. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't ask questions. So, in fact, you didn't get a candy for question. How many did you ask? Was it two? Um, so while the board dries, I'm going to go to the whiteboard. thing is that for this free field theory, you see what you do in perturbation theory of course is you um, solve the, the easy problem and then use the easy problem to solve the hard problem. And, or to approximate the hard problem actually, I should say to solve the hard problem. It turns out that the ground state wave function is known and this is in um, in on a chapter on functional integration in my book, which is chapter, I guess, 18 in the first edition. Anyway, apart from a constant c, it's e to the minus one half integral by tilde. And this is just the three-dimensional Fourier transform squared. Um, square root of p vector squared plus m squared d cubed p over 2 pi cubed. And so all this is in the exponential. So that's uh, where again, let me just say phi tilde of p is just an integral e to the minus i p dot x phi of x d cubed x. Right, okay. And c is a normalization factor that cancels in path integrals. It's like those factors that appeared many times today. Um, so, there are these two factors. There's, there is, there'll be something like this, zero, whoops, that should be a zero. Vacuum, phi b, and then phi a, vacuum. And what these things do is they bring in a, a term which can be thought of or can be computed and it's the square root of p squared plus m squared and then it will be phi tilde of pt squared plus phi tilde of p minus t squared and then d q to p over 2 pi q. So it's basically this wave function, but evaluated for phi b and phi a. And I should have said, in fact, there should be a subscript here. This one is uh, b, and this one is a. So 
I should have done that. Now, this thing can be rewritten as, there's a formula, I'll just say what the formula is, f of infinity minus, no, plus f of minus infinity, so f is some reasonable function, is a limit as epsilon goes to zero through positive values of epsilon times an integral minus infinity to plus infinity f of t e to the minus epsilon absolute value of t dt. Okay, so if you use this identity and this to evaluate this expression, what you find is that this expression can be written as e to the delta. It induces, in effect, a change in the free action. And this, this uh, thing is where, where delta of S0 of phi is um, a limit epsilon goes to zero plus i epsilon over two integral square root of p squared plus m squared integral phi tilde of p and t squared e to the minus epsilon absolute value of t dt d cubed p two pi cubed. Well, the this, um, in a sense, I'm, we're making a mountain out of a molehill because the molehill we're looking for is I epsilon. Um, and basically, with, uh, I'm going to skip a few steps. This is basically the limit. Epsilon goes to zero plus i epsilon over 2 integral square root of p squared plus m squared phi tilde of p squared, now d fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth. And um, so what one does is um, say that this, that uh, this square root is obviously positive and if you can absorb the square root into the epsilon, and um, the result is that we have a new action. That S0 of phi, we have an, uh, an action S0 of phi and epsilon, which is S0 of phi plus delta S0 of phi. And this turns out to be minus a half it's basically the old action, but with an i epsilon. And so this is p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon d fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth. That's 2 pi to the fourth. So this is the origin of the i epsilon in the Feynman. Um, now the next thing I want to do is to introduce something that people call Z0 of J. And this is just the time ordered product of E to the I integral J of X phi of X d fourth x where this j is a c number current c number is um, old fashioned um, line lingo for uh, complex in other words it's not an operator it's just a multiple of the identity operator just a complex valued function 
of space and time. In other words, it's a classical current coupled to the scalar field phi. And well, we know what this is. The recipe that we've seen several times today is it just a ratio of path integrals. And the first path integral is e to the i s0 of 5, of course. But then the rest of this is just plus i integral j5 d4 of x, all in the exponent d5. And then the denominator term is just e to the i s0 of 5 d5. So that's um, that's uh, the path integral expression for the time ordered product of an exponential of something linear in a classical current and the scalar field. And um, I'll remind you, by the way, that a classic, if you couple a classical current to the electromagnetic field, um, and that's all there is in your theory, then what, uh, what uh, that generates is uh, coherent states. Um, that's something Blauer proved a very long time ago. So um, what's the scoop now? I think I think what I'm going to do now is to skip a number of tr intellectually trivial manipulations that one does with one's fingers, changes of variables, and um, what happens is that we can combine all those terms, the field, the I epsilon, the classical current, into one uh, action term. And that action term is um, the original action at a shifted field and epsilon plus a half an integral, and this turns out to be j star tilde of p, j of p, Fourier transform. The change of variables introduces a Feynman propagator here. So as I said, it's in the notes. Um, the change of variables is one simply lets let me put it this way. It's one lets phi tilde equal to psi tilde equal to phi tilde minus j tilde over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. If you do that, you get this. And then a couple of more shifts. And what you find is that z0 of j, which is that. Um, which, remember, is vacuum time-ordered product e to the i integral j phi d fourth x. This thing can be rewritten as um, e to the i over 2 integral j tilde of p absolute value squared d fourth p p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon to pi to the fourth. So that is a, um, a very nice expression because um, this involves an operator. Um, you know, now that I think of it, um, this thing, really, apart from a phase factor, is uh, a 
vacuum matrix element of a coherent state. Um, anyway, leave that aside for the moment. Um, notice that in this expression here, everything has gone away, and the reason is that this C0 is a ratio of path integrals. So all those awkward things in other words, those infinite products and those limits of n going to infinity and epsilon going to zero, they all cancel. And one just has this. And um, another way of writing this is that this is e to the i over 2 integral j of x if we go in, if we Fourier transform into real space instead of momentum space, x minus y j of y, d fourth x, d fourth y. And, well, that's, that's basically it. And this delta function is um, one, one of the Feynman propagators. Delta of x minus y is e to the i p x minus y over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon d fourth p over 2 pi to the fourth um, and um, so that's a very nice expression and in fact I this expression is so nice that I think I think people in, in the quantum field theory community have gone a little bit nuts about it. In other words, they, they thought that there's something sacred or religious about this linear form here. And um, they basically refuse to use other things that are more complicated but more physically reasonable. But let me leave that aside. Um, let's suppose we do a 1 over i, a functional derivative of z0 of j with respect to j of x. Well, this is vacuum then, time ordered product, and it brings down one field, phi of x, and then still e to the i integral j phi d fourth x prime, say, zero. Functional derivatives, I have a chapter in the book on functional integrals and um, where the whole business is explained, I think, pretty clearly. Um, in any event, continuing to do functional differentiation, what one gets is that vacuum time ordered product of five, four fields, phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, by phi two, I mean phi of x two. This is one over i to the fourth, and it's a fourth functional and different uh, derivative of j of z zero of j with respect to phi one. Uh, phi 4, and this turns out to be minus delta x1 minus x2, delta x3 minus x4, and it's uh, four, three terms, minus delta x1 minus x3, delta x2 minus x4, God, my writing is getting worse, and then minus delta of, uh, let us say, x1 minus x4, delta of x2, x2 minus x3. Okay. So things like this are used in, this is the way one can do perturbation theory from a functional path integral point of view. And in fact, Srednicki in his book, adopts this as the way of doing things. And I think actually 
that C does that as well, and I think it's making things unnecessarily sophisticated, but maybe not, I don't know. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna skip uh, the rest of this section. Um, I think the boards are dry. Um, so now I've got um, two more topics. One is application to quantum electrodynamics and um, fermionic path integrals. Shall I, which, which would you rather see? Fermionic path integrals or uh, some of the, or the QED? I'd rather see QED. You'd prefer the QED. Okay. I, I was waiting on everyone else to talk and nobody else talked. So. What? I said I was waiting on someone else to talk and no one else talked. So. In other words, Grassman stuff or QED? I don't know both. All right, so it seems to be that you want the, um, I tell you what, I'll try to do the, 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 the QED fast enough that I can do some of the Grassman. Um, well, basically, as we learned with um, Weinberg, uh, our, in class, where we're basically following Weinberg's approach. Um, the Hamiltonian for quantum electrodynamics is the Hamiltonian for the electrons plus um, a, uh, something for the electromagnetic field, which is um, in the Coulomb gauge here. And Putting in a current like the current, um, well, let me just say the, well, let me just, this is not the class, this is not the C number current, this is a real current. DQX plus a Coulomb term. The Coulomb term is a half integral J0 of X and T, J0 of Y and T. Whole pi x minus y d cubed x d cubed y. And remember uh, the operators a and pi are canonically conjugate, but they satisfy the Coulomb gauge conditions, which are that the divergence of a and the divergence of pi. zero. And so basically if we just apply to this theory the techniques that we've gone through in the last couple of days for a scalar field theory, what one finds is that and I'm a little puzzled as to why I switched to um, ground state of the interaction theory. Anyway, omega is, is the vacuum, and whether we should be using the physical vacuum or the uh, vacuum of the free field theory, um, to tell you the truth, I'm not, I mean, I'm not really sure. I haven't thought about that lately. Anyway, there are a bunch of operators or one through or when, time ordered product, omega, and we'll be insisting that these be gauge invariant operators, but at the moment, we don't need to do that. At the moment, everything's just in the Coulomb gauge. So then this is an integral, O1 through ON, e to the i, the uh, 
action in the Coulomb gauge and uh, the Coulomb gauge condition, and that's a functional delta function of the divergence of A, and then we are integrating <coughs> dA and then also over the fermions. And of course, we still have to take a ratio. And the ratio is uh, E to the I S C delta of Coulomb gauge condition D A D psi. Um, this S sub C is the Coulomb gauge action, and it is a half a dot squared, and this is a three vector, minus a half for a squared plus a dot j plus the matter Lagrangian, all that d4 of x, and then minus the Coulomb term, integrated over time. And this functional delta function is basically a product over all space time points of delta of the divergence of A of X. Okay, now there are a bunch of tricks which um, allow us to write this action in, in, in some rather nice ways. The first trick is that, um, notice that at this stage, we've gotten rid of A0 and replaced it with a Coulomb term. So we've solved for A0 in terms of the charge density. So there's no A0 here. There's just A1, A2, A3, and those satisfy the Coulomb gauge condition. So there are really only two electromagnetic fields left. What we're going to do now is we're going to introduce, we're going to reintroduce A0 as a mathematical device. And um, we're going to introduce it uh, through a factor, which I've given the term I, I'd like to use F for these factors. And you can, you can think that F stands for fudge, but um, it's, it's actually legitimate. This is EXP of I integral, actually it's I over 2 integral uh, grad A0 plus grad inverse Laplacian J0 squared d4 of x. This is in the exponent. And then we're path integrating all, all the A0s. So A0 is just a function, an arbitrary function, and we're, uh, that we're introducing as a um, mathematical device. The inverse Laplacian is in fact just equal to uh, minus 1 over 4 pi x minus y. So that's what the inverse Laplacian is. And so the first thing to do is uh, we can integrate by parts. And integrating by parts, we can write this integral in several ways. EXP i over 2 integral. And we've got a curl of, we've got grad A0 squared from the first term, and then 
Um, the cross term, when we integrate by parts, we can take this gradient and pull it across so that it hits this gradient. Then we have Laplacian inverse Laplacian, which cancel. And so we get minus a0 j0. And then the square of this term, which is minus, actually this is 2 here. Uh, minus j0 inverse Laplacian j0 t4 x. And I guess I go over here. So um, that's what happens when we integrate by parts. And then we can realize this is just a Coulomb term. So another way of writing this is exp i integral a half grad a0 squared minus a0 j0 uh, plus i b coulomb or integral b coulomb dt this is d4 of x. Well, this is dt. And then dA0. So this is a number. And we can multiply the numerator and the denominator here by f. So we can basically do this, f, f. And that changes, then, the uh, ratio of path integrals. This is one of the reasons why I talk so much in terms of ratios of path integrals, whereas most people just talk about path integrals. Um, but you really need to be talking about ratios. And now if you absorb f into this path integral, what it turns out is that, that um, we get the following expression. In other words, this thing is equal to an integral O1 through ON e to the is prime functional delta function. And now it's dA d psi, but we're integrating over all four components. Whereas previously, we were integrating over a vector. And then, of course, we have this ratio, e to the i s prime, Coulomb gauge condition, d a d sine ratio. And this s prime now is equal to a half a dot squared vector minus a half curl. equal to zero. And um, in particular, we can add to it the term del dot a dot times a zero. And then if we integrate by parts, this turns into minus a dot dotted into grad a zero. And when we do that, S prime turns into S, 
which is now an integral of one half a dot minus grad a zero squared minus a half curl a squared plus a dot j minus a zero j zero plus matter action density all that d four of x. Well, if you look at that again, you see that's just the Lorentz invariant, gauge invariant action that um, we would uh, we would want. In other words, what we've arrived at here is that we can replace s prime by s, where s is just equal to. Let me get the sign right. Integral of minus a quarter f, let us say, a, b, f, a, b, plus a, b, j, b, plus l, m, d fourth x. So in other words, it's the action without any gauge fixing. Um, and of course, you might say, well, but these fields are on a different footing. The, the a vector are fields that come from an operator. A0 came from a trick. But remember, in a path integral, all we have are classical functions that we're integrating over. So um, this distinction between an A1 that comes from a quantum field and A0 that comes from a mathematical trick from this factor F, um, this is a distinction that doesn't really mean anything. Um, so at this point, the remnant of the um, Coulomb gauge condition is, there's still a Coulomb gauge condition. We've replaced S prime by S, where S is this very nice action that's Lorentz invariant, gauge invariant, everything. However, we still have explicitly the Coulomb gauge enforced by this delta function. And now there are two choices. Um, well, actually, before we do two choices, oh, well, we're already out of time. Um, well, you guys tell me. If you want, I'll try to wrap this up in five minutes. Or we can stop here, and then on Thursday I'll finish this and do some other stuff. So let's vote. Um, I'll turn around. You tell me what the vote is. In other words, stop and continue on Thursday. We've had enough. Or, um, or go another five minutes. What's the five minutes? Go five minutes? All right. Okay, well, let me go over, I think, and go to the whiteboard then. Um, guess is that it's uh, measured in two or three years and then they're useless. I once had an office in which somebody had written with a permanent marker on the whiteboard. Yeah. I tried all sorts of stuff to erase it, but I, I think there is a product that takes it off, but I didn't find it. I think you can mark over it with a dry erase and then erase it, it'll come off usually. Really? I tried 100% alcohol, which was a fire hazard, but at the time it was China. And um, there, um, 
very loose about rules, so I could take, well, I, I shouldn't, we've got a lot to do. Okay, now let's think about gauge transformations. Oops, I'm trying to write on the board with, so let's try, let's try black now. So what I'm going to do is do a gauge transformation. over all gauge fields, notice. In the numerator and the denominator, we're integrating over all gauge fields. So the fact that um, uh, I do a gauge transformation has no effect. Um, it's just uh, a change of variables with no effect. Um, and now, this S is gauge invariant. I'm assuming now that the operators here, or the functions here, are gauge invariant. These things are gauge invariant. Um, or let us say that they better be arranged to be gauge invariant. That's another subtlety that is actually related to axions. But, um, and so the only funny part is this. So now there are two choices. Um, the first choice is that we just integrate over all gauge functions in the numerator and over all gauge functions in the denominator. And um, what happens is that we arrive at this expression, omega t of O1 through On is then a ratio of O1 through On e to the is dA d psi divided by e to the is dA d psi. So this is integrating over all gauge functions. And when we integrate over all gauge functions, um, this uh, delta function goes away. And um, uh, so that's, so, so the deal is that we don't fix the gauge, we just get the left hand side in terms of a ratio of functional integrals when we integrate over any, everything. Um, the other possibility is that we multiply the numerator and denominator by an exponential which is e to the minus i over 2 alpha integral Laplacian on lambda squared d fourth x. And what this does is it winds up fixing the gauge. And um, so if we, multi if we multiply numerator and denominator by that, in effect we're changing s. And the new s becomes s sub alpha, which is minus a quarter fab fab minus alpha over 2 dBAB squared plus ABJB plus LM d fourth x. And so that means that this formula here becomes this, but with an alpha. And this is the gauge fixed formula. And, um, but the advantage is that instead of being gauge fixed with the Coulomb gauge, 
We're gauge fixed in a gauge that's much nicer because it's Lorenz invariant. And, um, and in particular, alpha equals one is, fi is called Feynman gauge. And if you actually just leave the alpha there and do the calculation, then one of the checks on the calculation is that it shouldn't depend on alpha. All the alpha terms should cancel. And so that's um, basically a check there. And um, if we do go to Feynman gauge, then what one finds is that the path integral here, a mu of x, a nu of y, is minus i delta x minus y mu nu, which is minus i integral eta mu nu over q squared minus i epsilon e to the i q x minus y d fourth q over 2 pi to the fourth. All right, I think we can quit now. Um, so in other words, there are these various tricks that one can play. And um, one takes then, one starts with a Coulomb gauge path integral and then turns it into a, a Coulomb gauge ratio of path integrals and turns it into either something um, where we integrate over all gauge fields or into something where we have gauge fixing, but it's nice gauge fixing. And uh, that's Lorenzo Barron. So that's, that's basically the story.